Okay, so it's now my pleasure to introduce Mr. Chris Gaynor. Chris has a long and uh, distinguished career. He's a historian who specializes in technology in space and uh, aviation technology. Uh, he's authored five books, and we have at least three of them in the museum uh, library. I know his newest one is actually, it's about uh, the intercontinental ballistic missile. It's called The Bomb in America's Missile Age. There's two on the Avro Arrow. Uh, and uh, one on a general history of rocketry, I'll call it, to a distant day. And a final one, Canada in Space. Now, in his spare time, he's the president of the Royal Astronomical Society uh, in Canada. He's also the editor of Quest, the History of Space Flight Quarterly uh, magazine. Just don't ask him how much it costs to subscribe to it, because he, he has no idea. He's very embarrassed about that. But it's on the website. So besides that, he's not in sales. He's, he's the editor here. So he's got that. And he's also a fellow with the British and uh, Interplanetary Society. He's going to talk about the, the Hubble. And there's probably very, very few people in the known universe that would be more qualified to talk about this. Because uh, Chris is working under contract with NASA to write the official uh, history of the Hubble Space Program, uh, Space Postcode. So we're extremely pleased to have Chris back. So Chris. Thank you. Uh, maybe we can uh, lower the lights over here a little bit. So you can see the, see what's on the screen. Uh, a couple a couple of things uh, before. Is the projector on? That's a that's a good question. <laughs> Just press that, uh, sorry, I should have done this. My apologies. Anyway, uh, so I've uh, spoken here a couple of times about the Avro Arrow, and uh, uh, there is a little bit of news I have on that. Uh, actually, the day that uh, Ted Barris was here, the post office issued five stamps with an aviation theme on it, on them. Uh, uh, there was uh, one with Billy Barker on it, one with Elsie McGill, uh, Punch Dickens was on one, the, la the, the Lay's Air was on another, and finally, uh, at long last, 60 years after it was cancelled, the Avro Arrow appeared on a stamp. And, and uh, uh, I was able to uh, consult with the uh, post office on that one to just make sure all the details uh, work correct, and that was uh, a really great pleasure. And I know those stamps are still available in uh, in your friendly neighborhood post office. If you're uh, if you want to put something nice and aviation themed uh, on your outgoing mail. Um, so yes, I haven't spoken yet on on my uh, missile book. I might uh, I might do that next time because actually. That story uh, is very much about the state of uh, uh, the United States Air Force in the immediate years after the war. So I'm actually talking a lot about aircraft in addition to uh, missiles in that book. But uh, tonight uh, I'm talking about the, uh, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. So about four or five years ago, uh, uh, some folks at NASA decided that they wanted a history of Hubble operations. There's actually quite a good book written about how uh, Hubble was built. And there was a competition uh, amongst historians, and I was uh, fortunate enough to be picked for that uh, job. So I've, uh, I've written a manuscript of that book, and uh, I took a little bit of a break from it. And now we're getting back to work on it, and I expect to have it uh, uh, published next year sometime by NASA and next year is going to be a significant year for Hubble because it's going to be 30 years since it was launched believe it or not it's been it's been up that long and uh, so I, w I was here uh, watching uh, 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 Ted Barris's 
great presentation. It, it was great and it deserved the, 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 the big crowd that it got. And I was sitting there thinking, well, I should, I should probably uh, up my game a little bit because I've developed a, a, a talk about Hubble, which I've given a number of times, uh, but usually I'm speaking to astronomy clubs and things like that, so it's very heavy on the science. And I thought, well, this, uh, uh, most of you are interested in, uh, in, in flying, a lot of you are pilots. And, and uh, that is actually a big part of this, the story of Hubble. So uh, you're getting uh, kind of a different talk from my usual talk. Some of, the, uh, some of it has uh, some of the features in the talks I usually give. But I'm going to talk uh, a bit more about the Hubble and its relationship with the space shuttle. Because I don't know if you've ever had a speaker on the space shuttle. You may, you may have had one in the distant past. But, uh, uh, of course, the, the shuttle is, is really interesting uh, because it's not only a spacecraft, it's also uh, an aircraft, at least on the way down. And, uh, and uh, so I thought you would be interested in that aspect of it. And Hubble, uh, uh, it's really difficult to imagine Hubble being what it is without the space shuttle. That's the reason it's still going after 30 years, because it's been regularly serviced uh, during its lifetime. So, uh, so I'm going to be talking about Hubble and also the shuttle. Um, this, this slide here, incidentally, uh, shows a picture of Hubble taken on the, uh, the last uh, servicing mission which is actually, uh, we're just a month short of, a, of a 10 years since the last shuttle visited uh, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. So, um, so I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about, uh, about the Hubble Space Telescope and also about uh, the person it's named after and, and the reason that uh, the, the main scientific purpose of Hubble. So it's named after this fellow, uh, Edwin P. Hubble, who uh, is, is one of the most important uh, astronomers, in, certainly in American history, and just perhaps period. His big discovery, which was made in the 1920s, almost uh, 100 years ago, was, was that our universe is much more than our galaxy, the Milky Way. A hundred years ago, a lot of astronomers, the majority probably, not all of them, believed that, that the universe basically was made up of what we know today is our Milky Way galaxy. And we, we saw, um, people saw these, these faint objects. For example, there was a thing that a hundred years ago was known as the Andromeda Nebula. And, uh, but nobody knew how far away it was. Now, I'm not uh, in the interest of fitting in kind of the uh, aviation, uh, or the, the shuttle part of it, I'm not going to go into great detail, but in astronomy, it's really difficult to figure out how far away something is. You know, when you're, when you're standing outside and you see, a, say, a truck on a distant hill, you can figure out how far away it is because you know how big the truck is and how perhaps how light its uh, bright its headlights are, but you don't know that with a given star or or an object such as the Andromeda Nebula as it was, and uh, uh, so ast astronomers have been trying to figure out well are there certain types of stars where we can figure out how bright they are. And they eventually uh, did uh, uh, set on that. Uh, they're, they're called uh, uh, Cepheid variable stars. And, and so um, uh, one night, or over a few nights, uh, in 1921-22, Hubble made some observations of the Andromeda Nebula 
with the uh, telescope, 100-inch telescope at Mount Wilson, which at the time was the only telescope bigger than the one on Little Sandwich Mountain, by the way. And he, uh, he, he made a number of, uh, took a number of images and discovered a, a Cepheid variable in Andromeda. And uh, uh, by measuring the, the light of that, he determined that Andromeda was about a million light years away, which meant it was well outside the Milky Way, and that Andromeda was in fact a galaxy of its own. And, uh, and so we call it the Andromeda Galaxy, and usually when you see a picture of a galaxy, it's Andromeda. And if you're out in the darkness, you can, if you know where to look, you can see it with the naked eye. Not, not in town, but uh, in a dark sky, it's, uh, it's so bright. And actually, Hubble was wrong about the distance. It's actually about two and a half uh, million light years away. Uh, but anyway, he, uh, uh, with that simple measurement, he basically found the proof that our universe is in infinitely larger than we thought it was. So that's kind of the, 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 the main reason uh, and that uh, the Hubble Space Telescope was built because it, a lot of the work it's, it's been doing has been measuring how big the, the universe is and, and how old it is. It's, uh, uh, and uh, the, the figure that they came up with is 13.8 billion years. That's how, that's how old the universe is. And that's also uh, gives you a, a sense of its dimension, uh, dimensions, 13.8 billion uh, uh, light years uh, across. So, uh, um, so just, uh, just a little bit, what, what do you get from a, 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 a telescope in space that you don't get on Earth? Well, uh, I, don't think, uh, I don't think I have to tell anybody in this crowd that our atmosphere is turbulent uh, and uh, it not only throws planes around but it, it also uh, makes it difficult to, uh, to see, uh, see distant faint objects clearly. Uh, our atmosphere is the reason that stars twinkle for example, if you're in space they don't twinkle. Um, it's the reason why when uh, you see a picture of Mars taken from the Earth, it's usually fuzzy, you know. Uh, but when you get above the atmosphere, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot clearer. The other thing is that astronomers are interested in, in observing objects in many uh, different wavelengths. Uh, fortunately, our atmosphere protects us from a, a lot of wavelengths, because other, otherwise we'd all be cooked to a crisp, uh, you know, by, for example, infrared light. So uh, the visible wavelengths that we look at are very, very narrow. So uh, basically what NASA has been doing uh, uh, throughout the, certainly starting in the 90s, is launching a, a number of what they call great observatories. Hubble is the most famous one because it operates in optical wavelengths that, that we are accustomed to, but also in uh, near infrared and near ultraviolet. But there's also other other spacecraft. Uh, this this one is called the Spitzer Space Telescope. It looks at infrared light. Uh, the Chandra. Uh, which is uh, celebrating 25 years in space, that looks at X-ray sources in space. And, uh, and this one, uh, the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory, looks at uh, gamma rays that, they're, that are emitted. And by, by tying all these observations together, astronomers uh, get a, a better idea uh, of, of what stars are doing. They not only take pictures of it, a lot of the work, perhaps most of it, is getting uh, uh, spectrograms, you know, through, through uh, <coughs> prisms or things like that. And it gives you the footprints of the stars. It tells you what their chemical makeup is, uh, what they're moving, uh, how they're moving, and, and things like that. 
just uh, a little bit about the infrastructure uh, of, uh, of Hubble. So, it, the Hubble itself is about as big as a school bus and it's, it's orbiting roughly about 300 miles high. But, uh, and it, it communicates with Earth by what we call these uh, TETRA satellites, tracking and data relay satellites. You might remember the old space missions in the old days, they used to have tracking stations all over the place. Don't need those anymore because we have these uh, TDRA satellites in geosynchronous orbit, the same uh, 35,000 kilometers high, uh, which is the same as communication satellites. So they can just uh, uh, beam up and, and, and back through these TDRA satellites. TDRA satellites are also used for a whole variety uh, of other satellites. Uh, uh, for example, military reconnaissance satellites, the space station, shuttle, ver various other satellites. Um, Hubble's control center is at the Goddard Space Flight Center, uh, just outside Washington. Uh, it's not, it's not uh, as well known uh, Goddard as, say, the Johnson Space Center in Houston, where the uh, uh, control center is for Apollo and the shuttle and all that, uh, but it's quite important. A lot of satellites are controlled there and some of them uh, are built there. Uh, it's kind of uh, really a, a serious science center for NASA. And uh, there's also in Baltimore, about a half hour, three quarters of an hour drive from Goddard, is the Space Telescope Science Institute, which is where the scientists who work on the uh, uh, on Hubble work, but scientists all around the world uh, apply for for uh, observing time on Hubble, and some of our folks here at the at the uh, Dominion Astrophysical Observatory uh, uh, have have done a, their share of observing with Hubble, and some of them are actually also involved in the committees that uh, you have in uh, uh, large scientific enterprises that help uh, run these things. Uh, just another interesting note about, uh, about the, the DAO. Although Canada is not a formal partner in Hubble, uh, but NASA is and so is the European Space Agency, there's three places on Earth where you can find a complete archive of Hubble information. One is at the, uh, the Space Telescope Institute in Baltimore, that I mean, just that's on this slide. The other one is in Europe, uh, I think in Spain now. And the third one is up at the DAO. It's uh, it's because uh, the, uh, the the folks at the DAO were so advanced in. Uh, archiving information from telescopes uh, like Hubble that uh, that they got uh, they they got their own uh, archive. So uh, so Canada is even though it's not a formal partner in Hubble, we certainly uh, uh, punch uh, above our weight in that. So uh, and actually today there's so much information in the archive from Hubble. That, uh, that a lot of people don't even ask for time on Hubble. You can, they can just go into, uh, into their computer and, uh, and, and look up uh, data from, from Hubble. It won't necessarily be what they're looking for, but often, often it is. So I want to talk about, uh, uh, as I said, I was going to be talking a lot about this, the space shuttle. So the, the space shuttle, uh, uh, was started in 1972 by uh, President Nixon uh, as kind of the successor to uh, Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo. Uh, and, uh, and it started flying in 1981 and flew 135 times between then and uh, 2011 when it flew for the last time. There were uh, 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 five, uh, five shuttles built, and uh, and so they 
they shared those missions, and as you know, uh, uh, two of them uh, uh, ended in two of those missions ended in disaster. But uh, during that time, uh, uh, during the 30 years of the shuttle, it certainly achieved quite a bit. For example, building the International Space Station, launching lots of satellites, uh, doing lots of research on its own. Six of its missions uh, involved uh, Hubble, and they were certainly very coveted uh, missions am amongst the astronaut corps uh, because they were uh, very ambitious missions. Uh, they actually flew higher than any uh, uh, shuttle missions that, that, uh, that I'm aware of. And the reason I say that I'm aware of is there's a, there's a few missions that, uh, shuttle missions that were flown for the uh, uh, Department of Defense uh, where all the data is still secret. Um, and, uh, and so this, uh, this slide is, it sort of de depicts a typical uh, sh shuttle mission. You have your orbiter and it's attached to this great fuel tank that, uh, that contains uh, uh, liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, and fuels the, 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 the three great big engines on the, the bottom of the orbiter. And then you have these two solid fuel rockets. Uh, so uh, uh, the shuttle is actually the only vehicle uh, where you have humans on board that used solid rocket uh, motors. And those are, those are not for the faint-hearted. Uh, they kind of run rough, shall we say. So you were you were getting a ride when you're going on uh, on on the shuttle during the launch phase, and of course when you turn those things on, you can't turn them off, and that was certainly one of the big reasons uh, for the uh, Challenger disaster in 1986. They had a uh, a problem, uh, a kind of a burn through on one of those uh, 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 solid motors, and uh, and it. it it, the Challenger and the, the, the tank uh, beside it actually didn't explode, but it was kind of a, an aerodynamic breakup. And uh, uh, so, uh, and then uh, you have your, once, once it's launched, the, uh, the, the solid uh, rocket motors can be uh, recovered, refurbished, and reused. And of course, the orbiter is reused. The, the that great tank, though, uh, burns up. So, uh, and then you have your operations in orbit. Uh, part of them involved the the cannon arm that was made uh, in Brampton, actually. And then, after it completes its mission, uh, it uh, fires its retro rockets and goes through reentry and for a brief period of time flies but as a glider and uh, uh, so those are some, uh, some of the functions of the, uh, of the shuttle. Now I'm just going to talk a little bit about its function and, uh, and, and uh, some of the compromises that uh, affected what the shuttle is. The original design of the shuttle uh, was actually, actually involved uh, a smaller spacecraft with just little stubby wings. <clears throat> but uh, NASA by itself was not going to have sufficient support to build a shuttle because after they went to the moon they said, let's spend money here on Earth. NASA's budget was cut in, in four after Apollo. And uh, so they got the Air Force on board. And the Air Force said, well, we want uh, a vehicle uh, uh, that, that can carry large intelligence uh, reconnaissance satellites into space. So they made the shuttle bigger and they said, by the way, we want Delta wings so it has a cross-range capability. That was for uh, uh, missions that were supposed to be launched uh, out of Vandenberg, California. And that never happened because of the uh, 
the Challenger explosion into a polar orbit where it could go up and drop a, a, a satellite uh, and then uh, make one orbit and come back to Vandenberg. But as you know, the Earth moves uh, and so they needed that cross-range capability to get back to Vandenberg. So, so that meant it had the big delta wings and it also needed uh, it also meant that it was subject to more severe temperatures on the way down. And uh, it dealt with them with these, uh, with these uh, tiles that could handle an incredible amount of heat. And you could pick them up when they were red hot. But they were also very fragile, and that was a, an element in the loss of columbium. Um, let's see. Um, Okay, so I'm just going to uh, go back to Hubble for uh, a minute. The, uh, uh, so the, the mission of STS-31 in 1990 was the, uh, was the flight which carried uh, 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 Hubble into space. So we're coming up on the, you know, in a few days, it'll be 29 years since that happened. And uh, uh, this is uh, this is quite uh, an interesting crew, you know. Uh, uh, Charlie Bolden, who was a pilot, later became the administrator of NASA, so he's kind of lived Hubble a lot. And uh, 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 Bruce McCandless, who uh, just passed away a couple of years ago, uh, he was uh, he was the guy who made the first spacewalk without uh, a tether. You see pictures of him in his uh, jetpack. He was also the guy who was sitting in the control center and talking to Neil Armstrong when he made his big step on the moon. Uh, and uh, he and uh, uh, when they launched Hubble, which you can see here, uh, they were having some they were having some problems getting the solar wings unfurled. And he and Kathy Sullivan, who were in that picture were actually getting in their uh, spacesuits and getting ready to go out and unfurl the wings, but they figured out how to do it without their help. So you can uh, you can uh, you can see it here. This is actually a, a picture taken from the back of the shuttle and the, the cabin where the astronauts are up here at the front, uh, and they're no doubt looking out the window as the cannon arm released it and. Uh, I just, uh, um, I actually thought this slide was going to be uh, a little earlier, but this, uh, and it might be a little hard to see, but uh, uh, this, this gives you uh, a, a bit of an idea of, uh, of some of the maneuvers that, that uh, they have to do on the way down. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, pilot, the two pilots they have at the front, uh, in the front seats of the Hubble, are, are, are the, of the shuttle, are very skilled. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about, about them as, as we go on. Uh, but uh, the important thing to remember with the shuttle is that you only have one chance at the landing, because the shuttle is a glider, and it is, uh, it is coming down at uh, quite a clip. I wanted to talk a little bit about the training, uh, and actually, uh, I draw your attention to uh, this picture here. Uh, that's a picture actually taken during a, a shuttle flight on the way down. So I doubt if, uh, if, uh, if any of you have approached a runway from that angle. Can you see the runway in this picture? Yes, the runway, the runway is right there. Oh yes, okay, I thought that was a tower. No, that's a runway. So uh, that is that is going down in quite a clip. So I I wanted to talk a little bit about how they train. This is a, a specially modified, I think, a Gulfstream executive jet that they use. It's called the shuttle training aircraft, and you can see the cockpit here. This is a, a, a shuttle cockpit. I hope I'm not standing in too many people's ways. Uh, this is a, a, a simulated shuttle cockpit, and this is later on because uh, this has the uh, 
the uh, glass cockpit that they had in the, the shuttle with these uh, computer displays. And this is the, uh, the control stick for the shuttle and the heads up display. Next to it is another, is the uh, regular control for the Gulf Stream. So, uh, uh, and so an astronaut will be sitting here and then a, a, another NASA pilot will be sitting here. So when they want to practice a landing, what they do is, is they lower the back two landing gear, not the front gear, uh, and then, uh, and then they, they turn on the thrust reversers. And down they go. And they, they practice and practice and practice. Um, and uh, they get a pretty authentic idea of what it's like to, uh, to uh, fly the shuttle down. I think the only problem with this is that, is that the cockpit, uh, you know, when, when you actually touch down, the, the, the cockpit in this aircraft is a lot lower, uh, a lot closer to the runway than the, uh, than in the case of the shuttle. So I think that takes, uh, uh, that, I think that sometimes surprises them when they're, when they're flying the real thing. And uh, while, uh, while we're talking about uh, aircraft associated with the shuttle, there's, uh, uh, there's a couple of others uh, that I should mention. Of course, the astronauts' personal playthings uh, uh, and transport are T-38 jets, which they've had since the, since the 60s. Uh, and they, they, they still use them today to get around to engagements, uh, but also, uh, also to just keep up their flying skills. Uh, and then when the, uh, when the shuttle lands at some place that's not its um, uh, uh, launching area, it has to be transported on top of this modified uh, 747. And uh, in the, uh, this is actually a picture that I took in 1983. The, the only time a shuttle came to Canada, the, uh, it, they flown uh, this, this shuttle over to Europe as a goodwill tour and it stopped at Ottawa on the way back and I happened to be there when it, uh, uh, when it came by. And uh, um, so in the early days when they wanted to test the landing characteristics of the shuttle, they, they built a shuttle called the Enterprise, which is not capable of flying in space. Uh, but it was used to test uh, various aspects of the shuttle, including its, its, uh, its uh, capabilities as a, as a glider. So uh, there was a series of flights in 1977 called the Approach and Landing Test, where they, uh, first of all, flew these aircraft together to see how they would go. Uh, and then, then they released the, the shuttle uh, and, uh, and did some landings with it. And, uh, um, and those tests were not without risk because, uh, because they weren't sure exactly how those aircraft were going to uh, uh, work together. It actually did work out fairly well. Um, but uh, I was just reading a, an interview. Uh, we, we have an article about these early tests in, in the latest issue of Quest. And one, one of the uh, astronauts who flew the shuttle in those approach and landing test said, well, you know, we had ejection seats on the shuttle, but the guys who had the guts were the guys who were flying the 747 because they didn't have ejection seats if something went wrong. Uh, but uh, anyway, the, uh, the 747 uh, was used throughout the, the shuttle program. Uh, sometimes the shuttle would land at Edwards Air Force Base. if. Uh, especially in the early days when they wanted to make sure they had lots of, uh, lots of wriggle room for their, their tests. And later on when the weather wasn't right at the Kennedy Space Center, uh, one of them landed at, in, uh, in New Mexico. Uh, there was a situation where they, they, they couldn't land at the Cape and, they, and Edwards had got rained in or something like that. So 
So they landed it in New Mexico in a desert where they had a lot of gypsum. And I think for years they were still uh, finding gypsum in, 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 uh, in Colombia, which is the shuttle used that time. I just uh, threw in this, this one of the Super Guppy, which is, uh, I think it was a, a constellation, uh, or um, let's see, what was it? It was modified uh, to carry um, rocket stages, but also payloads for the shuttle, say from their plant down, down to the Cape. And, uh, uh, and I think that's, uh, that's quite an interesting thing to fly. Oh yes, it was a, 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 a turbos, uh, uh, it was the military version, uh, yeah, the turbo strato cruiser, that's what it was made out of with the, with, with the extra large uh, 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 area for cargo there, which was a military version of a Boeing 377. That's, uh, that's what you don't hear about very much. So these are, these are some of the uh, aircraft associated with, uh, with the, the shuttle program. And uh, um, so we're going to go back to uh, Hubble now and, uh, and just talk a, a, a little bit about it. As I said, it's, it's about as big as a, uh, as a school bus, roughly. And it has a, a, a Newtonian telescope which uses uh, mirrors to gather light rather than a, a lens. Uh, and uh, uh, so the, the mirror is about here. The light comes in here, uh, reflects off this mirror, and then off of a smaller one, and down into these instruments. Uh, Hubble has a whole, has always had a whole, uh, a whole set of instruments, including cameras and spectrographs and photometers, to uh, uh, gather light from uh, stars and other things. Um, and it uh, it doesn't use thrusters; it uses uh, gyroscopes and momentum wheels to point itself. And it's, uh, it's, it's powered by solar panels. Um, actually, they've had to change out the solar panels a couple of times. Uh, the initial design wasn't that good. It, 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 uh, it shook quite a bit. And, uh, and so the, the picture I showed at the beginning actually shows the latest set, uh, which are smaller. This is, uh, this is just a list. I'm not going to go through them. but. Over the years, uh, the instruments on board uh, Hubble have been changed out. So the instruments on board today are actually entirely different and much more powerful and much more advanced than the instruments that, uh, that were uh, um, put on board when it was launched 30 years ago. And uh, there's kind of two kinds uh, of instruments. They're shaped. Some are shaped. Uh, like these uh, phone booths, and then others are shaped like baby grands, usually cameras. Uh, and uh, so it was always contemplated that shuttles would fly to Hubble to uh, uh, do refurbishment and change out these instruments. So you can see uh, this is uh, some, these are some astronauts changing out one of the instruments. <coughs> Well, when Hubble was launched in 1990, a few weeks later they started to take pictures. And they made a very unhappy discovery. They found out that the mirror, which was precision ground by, you know, probably cost millions to build. It was supposed to be the best uh, telescope mirror ever built was precisely ground to the wrong shape. And the shape, it was just out by length, of, uh, by the width of a human hair, less than that. But um, it meant that uh, the, most of the images it produced were kind of blurry. And uh, so uh, Hubble became kind of a laughing stock, or at least uh, 
uh, for those who could get past the price tag that it had cost to the taxpayers. But uh, uh, as an example of the laughing stock, I mean, I have these cartoons here, but if you ever saw a naked gun two and a half, uh, there's a scene where uh, uh, Leslie Nielsen, I think it is, goes into this uh, bar, which is, he's just had a romantic setback, and it's kind of for pe depressed people, and the walls are lined with pictures of things like the Hindenburg, and uh, uh, the Edsel, and various other things, and there's also a picture of the Hubble Uh So this is very hard on, on the people who worked on it, uh, you know, because they're very proud to be working on this thing. It was supposed to be the greatest telescope ever built, and this this comes up, and some of them, uh, you know, uh, uh, some of them took to the bottle to, to deal with it. It's it's a kind of a long and complicated story of what happened, but uh, when they were uh, grinding that mirror to the precise shape, it, it, the, the Hubble program was going through a period of financial and managerial stress. And they decided to cut corners on the testing. They did test it, but uh, when, when they couldn't get the testing rig to kind of work the way they wanted, somebody said, let's slip in this little washer. <laughs> and uh, so they, they got good results, but the problem is that they were wrong because of that washer. And other tests, which they should have done, weren't done. So this thing sat there for years, the mirror, and then was finally launched, and they discovered that it didn't work. So when, uh, uh, so this was one of the lowest moments of NASA. NASA was, in the early 90s, was having some problems. It had some problems with the shuttle. It periodically had problems. Uh, and uh, some other spacecraft were having problems, and people were saying, well, maybe, maybe it's time to wind up NASA. And, uh, uh, but within hours of figuring this out, people went to work on a fix. So they, uh, uh, one of the things that, uh, that, that they did right away was, uh, they were already working on a, on a new camera to be put in a few years after it was launched that was going to be better than the original camera. And so they started to redesign it with a couple of little extra mirrors in it, which were as big as dental mirrors, but they were shaped to compensate for this problem uh, with the mirror. But there's a whole bunch of other instruments, and how, how do you get them to work properly? Well, they created a new instrument called the CoStar, which also had these mirrors I was talking about, and they were kind of uh, moved out into the uh, path of the uh, uh, light from the telescope to the instruments. There was a guy named Jim Crocker. One day he was at a meeting in Europe of astronomers, and like they were just going crazy. How do we fix this thing? Do we send an astronaut into the telescope to fix it up? And, uh, they were just trying anything. Jim Crocker took a shower one day, one of those European showers that we now have a lot of here, but uh, didn't at the time. But it's, you know, you had the, the shower head and you could adjust it and move it around and up and down. And, and he, he realized, well, if we could do something like that in Hubble, we can fix it. So they created this instrument called the CoStar, which was kind of like that shower. Uh, uh, in terms of bending the light. So uh, on the, on the, the, the uh, mission of STS-61, uh, they installed these new instruments uh, along with uh, new solar panels uh, and uh, made some repairs to the, uh, to the, uh, to the hovel. And basically, uh, eliminated that the, the problems it had, and this was a I, this mission was extremely ambitious. They had uh, five spacewalks, uh, usually uh, uh, two astronauts each uh, on on the spacewalks, 
and they trained for a couple, uh, a couple of years uh, uh, to prepare for this mission. Uh, uh, and uh, I was, uh, a lot of us in Canada were able to uh, watch it because the CRTC, this is before uh, we had NASA TV on the internet. Uh, uh, the uh, cable networks were allowed to carry the wall-to-wall uh, -wall NASA coverage of these spacewalks. But uh, the, the preparations for this mission, I just can't emphasize uh, kind of how dramatic it was because uh, if that mission had failed, uh, it might have been the end of NASA. But they, they pulled it off and uh, um, so it's, it's one of the, 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 uh, the great missions of the, of the shuttle program. Um, but it also indicates that when you're using mirrors, it pays to reflect on the problem. That's right. <laughs> That's right. So this uh, uh, that that flight took place in the middle of December, and just just around Christmas, they they uh, they started taking pictures. And this is this is uh, uh, what is that M100? This galaxy. This is what it looked like in the early days, uh, and then after the repairs, and, and uh, actually, they've, uh, as time has gone on, they've put, uh, put on even better instruments uh, than, than those, so it gets uh, better and more spectacular images these days. So a few months after that mission, there was a, 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 an event, a comet crashed into Jupiter. I don't know if anybody remembers that. But uh, it was, it got quite a bit of coverage and interest at the time. And uh, uh, one of my friends, uh, longtime friends, is the PR guy for Hubble. And he said, even after the mission, people would call it, you know, the, the troubled Hubble or the repaired Hubble. But after this comet hit uh, Jupiter and Hubble sent back pictures, uh, it just became Hubble again. And it became kind of a point of, of uh, national pride, which is what they thought was going to happen in the first place. So, during the, the lifetime of Hubble, we had five servicing missions. I've just told you about the first one. And uh, I can't uh, really go into huge detail about the other ones, but they were all kind of uh, uh, distinct from each other. Uh, they all had their own little challenges. Some were uh, some were meant to uh, uh, just replace instruments. There is another situation where the uh, gyroscopes, almost all of them had failed, and Hubble was going to, uh, they practically had to shut off Hubble, uh, and they got this, uh, this mission up um, to uh, affect those repairs. Uh, it was also an, uh, an interesting thing because it was late December, of 1999, so they had to get the mission over with before December 31st, so it wouldn't get hit with the Y2K bug. Right. <laughs> this is a uh, this is a, a picture from the last servicing mission. Uh, John Brunsfeld, who's uh, who's kind of a uh, we've gotten to know him quite well, and he flew on three of those servicing missions, uh, and is. Uh, really identified with Hubble. So uh, they had to fill the, uh, the payload bay of the shuttle with all these, I guess, sophisticated cabinets uh, full of replacement instruments and tools and also backup uh, instruments uh, um, to, to carry them up and then, and then bring the old ones uh, back to Earth. So that was a, that was a lot, there was a lot of preparation went into these, in, into these missions. Um, and this is just a, a, a chart that, that shows uh, the, the various uh, servicing missions. We talked about the first one, and the, uh, the second one was changing out instruments. SM-3A, like they were originally going to just have a mission called uh, Servicing Mission 3. But when the gyros started to fail, they, 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 got, they split it into two missions 
and, and SM3A was the one I just spoke about, uh, which uh, got up there just before New Year's, and then uh, then some more instruments were changed out uh, in this one. So the last servicing mission almost didn't happen because of the Columbia disaster in 2003, and the administrator of NASA decided to cancel that servicing mission because after uh, uh, after that accident, which took place at the end of the mission, uh, if you flew to Hubble, uh, you were not going to be like, it was not going to be like flying to the space station, which all the other shuttle missions by then involved. You know, if, if you flew to the, the, the space station and discovered that your thermal protection system had been compromised, which is what happened to Columbia, you could at least uh, sit in the space station and wait for another shuttle to get you. You didn't have that option with Hubble. Uh, but uh, what happened is uh, the uh, administrator of NASA retired and another administrator came in. Meanwhile, there was uh, like kind of an outcry from astronomers and also the public to save Hubble. And so they, uh, uh, when that servicing mission flew 10 years ago, uh, SM4, there was, a, there was actually another shuttle sitting on the, pla uh, on the pad uh, ready to do a rescue mis mission if necessary. Uh, but fortunately that, that didn't happen. But uh, that mission has been uh, very successful because we're 10 years out from it now and Hubble is still operating. If, if say, the previous mission had been uh, the last mission, Hubble would have died years ago. Uh, the, uh, the gyroscopes, which are used to let Hubble know where it is, they, they spin at a very high rate and, and they just have a limited lifetime. Uh, they were able to uh, make the, the ones that were on this latest servicing mission last a little longer uh, than the uh, previous generation of gyroscopes. So Hubble is, is still going. Um, uh, but anyway, these, all of these missions involve uh, uh, a, a huge uh, amount of work. And these are just, uh, these are just some pictures of the, uh, of the other four crews of the uh, servicing missions. Uh, uh, some of them in space, and uh, thought you might like this one. Of course, after, after they come back to Earth, they like to uh, uh, walk around the, uh, the shuttle and kick the tires, just like uh, any pilot does after a flight. And, uh, and uh, uh, they, uh, they do that there. And uh, the, uh, the astronauts uh, uh, involved in these missions have kind of uh, come to be uh, accepted as a part of the community uh, around Hubble. I was down in Washington in Baltimore in, uh, in uh, uh, December, and it was the 25th anniversary of that first servicing mission I was talking about, and they, they, uh, they had a big party to celebrate, and, uh, and the MC was this guy here, uh, and here, uh, Scott Altman, who is actually the commander of the last two missions, and he's quite a character. He was actually, uh, if you've ever seen Top Gun, he's actually the guy who's flying those planes. I guess they're F-14s, if my memory serves me right. And on one of my visits uh, down to uh, Goddard to uh, uh, get information for my book, he was, he was there giving a talk uh, but it, it was nothing to do with Hubble, nothing to do with space. It was all about his experiences uh, flying F-14s. And he got a big crowd because, of course, a lot of the NASA people uh, were uh, uh, ex, ex military people. Or, so, uh, anyway, and uh, yeah, so he was the MC at this party a couple of months ago, and, and uh, John Brunsfeld was there, people like that. They're, they're, uh, they they they've really gotten into into Hubble, even though uh, you know they were located in another place. But uh, uh, they of course uh, really put 
they put their lives on the line really to uh, 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 keep Hubble going. And I'll say something else about that uh, uh, in a few minutes. So just, just quickly, of course, throughout its history, Hubble has taken some amazing pictures. Um, and these are just a, a, a couple I, I, uh, I picked at random. It also uh, has been kind of a, a useful thing for keeping track of uh, things in our solar system. Uh, for example, uh, Uranus and Neptune. The only good pictures we had of them was when a uh, spacecraft went by 40 years ago. And, but Hubble has been able to get good pictures of them. Pluto was still a little bit too far to get a clear picture, but uh, Hubble was used to help direct that spacecraft New Horizons that went by Pluto. Incidentally, uh, that object at New Horizons, you might have seen it on New Year's Day, uh, that very weird object in the Kuiper Belt, uh, that was found by Hubble. Um, so, uh, uh, and these are some of the uh, uh, scientific discoveries of, of Hubble. And I'm not, uh, usually I go into this slide in, in, in a bit more depth, but uh, uh, it, it's perhaps the most important discovery, which is done in conjunction with other uh, observatories, in, including some on Earth, uh, was that the uh, universe is expanding, but at an accelerating rate. And uh, they need more matter. For that to work, they need more matter than what we can see. Uh, so this is why they talk about dark energy and dark matter, because saying dark energy is basically a fancy way of saying we don't know what the hell it is, <laughs> but it, it has to be there somewhere. And this is the big question in astronomy and cosmology today. Uh, uh, we saw that picture of the black hole a week or two ago, the first picture of a black hole. That's a type of black hole that we call a supermassive black hole. And they kind of provide the gravitational glue that hold galaxies together. You have your garden variety black holes, but at the center of each galaxy, including our own, you'll find a supermassive black hole, uh, which are just, you know, billions of times bigger than our sun or more. Uh, and uh, um, and uh, that's what we got the picture of. Um, the extrasolar planets that we hear about these days. Now, they were discovered uh, on Earth. Uh, but, but when they knew where they were, they could point uh, Hubble at them. And it's been uh, gathering information on what those planets were made of. And then I mentioned some of the uh, solar system stuff. Um, this, I would argue, is the most important picture that Hubble has taken. It's called the Hubble Deep Field. And it was taken in uh, uh, 1995. It was a very, very long exposure, like several days, in a very empty piece of real estate near the Big Dipper. And so the director of the Space Telescope Institute was uh, has discretionary time. He has 10% of the time on Hubble, and he, it's always been a he so far, uh, uh, has been able to do with that whatever he wants. Of course, he has to answer for it to the community. And so this guy, his name was Bob Williams, and some people said, well, why don't we take a really long exposure and see what we find? It, it, kind of a cosmic uh, borehole, I guess. And some people said, you're wasting valuable time on Hubble. You're not going to find anything. Well, they took this image, and virtually everything here is a, is a galaxy. And some of them are very, very far away. So they've taken, uh, there's one or two stars like right there, but uh, they found that uh, there's sort of a, a, lot, a lot more to the universe. So 
they've taken a whole series of, of uh, <coughs> images like this, which uh, look farther back uh, to the closer to the Big Bang, farther back in time. This is the deep field, and this is what they've been able to uh, do with better instruments and, and also using uh, what they call gravitational lensing, and I'm not going to get into that. But uh, the uh, uh, astronomers want to look even farther back, so that takes us to the next telescope, which is the James Webb Telescope. Um, which is, it's been postponed several times. Right now it's supposed to be launched in uh, 2021. And it's just going to be launched on a regular rocket. Uh, actually a European rocket uh, from their site in uh, French Guiana, because the Europeans are involved in it. By the way, you and I are helping to pay uh, uh, for this one too, Canada is a partner in this, uh, this, this program. The, this James Webb Space Telescope is actually much bigger than, than Hubble, and uh, it's operating mainly in the infrared, because that looks farther back in time. Uh, and it, infrared telescopes need to be really cooled down, so it is going to be launched, it's going to be a million miles away, literally, from Earth. Uh, and it has this great big shield that, uh, uh, that allows it to operate in kind of a cool atmosphere. So it has to be launched on this rocket and kind of unfold like a big origami uh, thing. So, uh, so anyway, uh, uh, the, the hope is that Hubble will still be operating when this thing uh, goes up. And they hope that they will be able to operate in tandem for about two years together. Um, so just kind of wrapping up here, there's the question of, uh, you know, some people, uh, some people have wondered, well, can't we bring back Hubble when it no longer works? Uh, bring it back to Earth and, and put it in a museum. Now, Hubble, uh, as I said, it's, it's about 300 miles high. But it's expected, I, I suspect, you know, in, it's probably good for another five years. It will stay in orbit uh, until about 2035 is kind of the current guess. And then it will eventually strike the atmosphere and, and fall in. Now because it's so big and because some parts will survive the plunge to the atmosphere, um, NASA is mandated to send up a, a, a robotic spacecraft to join up with it and either uh, bring it to a controlled re-entry over, say, the Pacific probably, or send it into a higher orbit, a uh, graveyard orbit. The spacecraft has not been built yet, so that chapter remains to be written. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out. But um, actually, uh, a lot of the instruments from Hubble are already back on Earth because they were the previous generation instruments. Uh, and I just took these pictures on a visit to the uh, Smithsonian in, in Washington, D.C., the National Air and Space Museum, where you would find the Wright Brothers plane and the Spirit of St. Louis and, you know, just uh, a lot of great aircraft and spacecraft. Uh, this. This thing here is actually that CoStar instrument that first repaired Hubble. As they brought in the new instruments, they, were, uh, they didn't need CoStar after a while, so it was brought back to Earth. And then this is the camera uh, that took most of, those, uh, most of Hubble's famous pictures, including that deep field one. Now you're looking at that thing and you, said, you think, well, that, that thing looks like it uh, spent some time in Al Capone's basement. <laughs> Well, what that is, is these all represent places where it's been hit by orbital debris or micrometeoroids. But that isn't the, they actually uh, uh, took bigger holes to take them out to research them. So it didn't look like that when it came back. But you, you can see where it was struck. And that's actually kind of the shield on the exterior of it. And it, uh, uh, um, 
so it, it didn't uh, it didn't damage the camera itself. So the instruments you can see at the Smithsonian. There's also kind of a simulated version of Hubble that they built for some early tests, and you can also see the backup mirror that was built for Hubble, which was ground to the exact correct shape, but was never used. You can uh, you can see it there. Now. Uh, this has an interesting uh, uh, story, you know, there was some talk, why don't we get the astronauts to bring back Hubble? Well, one day they had a meeting, uh, and this was during the time when there was a debate about whether to have that last servicing mission after Columbia. They had a meeting in the astronaut office and they, they said, who would be willing to risk their necks to repair Hubble so it can get some more science? Well, practically every hand in the room went up. They said, who would like to put their necks on the line to uh, go and pick up Hubble so it can sit in the museum after it's finished? No hands went up. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so anyway, uh, just this last slide here. This is me sitting in the shuttle training aircraft, but in the, in the, the shuttle seat, but in the days before the glass cockpit. This was in 1999. So anyway, that's, uh, that's my talk. Thank you. All right, so we have, first of all, that's an amazing story told by an amazing fellow, just the perfect guy to tell the story. I mean, how lucky are we? And uh, I could speak personally, I, I, you know, I, I'm aware of Hubble and had followed the, we'll call it the adventure, and uh, knew, you know, a certain amount about it, but you added spice to the, to the meal, you know, with all these details, the insider uh, details that, you know, probably aren't even going to be in your book, at least some of it won't be necessarily in your book. So we feel, I can speak on behalf of the audience, privileged to have you here and very grateful that uh, you do these kinds of things for us. And I, I just want to add one thing on top of this. Uh, this was not, it was not our intention to have Chris tonight. Uh, he should have been and was scheduled to go last month. But then something happened and, you know, Ted Barris was uh, on a, a little bit of a swing out here. We had a chance to get Ted. So with uh, hat in hand, I phoned up Chris and said, look, Chris, uh, how would you uh, feel about changing the date? You know, and I felt, you know, kind of sheepish about this. And uh, he was a true gentleman and said, no problem. You know, what do you got? And I said, well, how about next month? He said, sure, I can do that. So it, it's things like that that me on a personal level uh, really appreciate because it, it's people like you and things, I see Bill who, who does a similar thing for the Commonwealth Air Crew, you know, you get you get into these speaker, uh, you know, quandaries, and uh, we really, really, really appreciate uh, cooperation. So we thank you on so many levels. We have such a wonderful gift for you, beautifully hand wrapped, <laughs> <laughs> the traditional bottle of fermented grape juice, and our thanks. Thank you.